Welcome back to the program. My name is Steve Elzey. I am the president of Your Sanctuary Productions. We're in the studio right now with Dr. Andrew DeVogelaire, who is the director of research for the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Andrew, thanks for visiting with us. We really appreciate that. Sure, it's always good to see you, Steve. Uh, uh, and, and I wanted to, uh, let's talk a little bit about creatures in the deep. Ah. We have been talking about incredible depths of up to 12,000 feet. Yes. Uh, what sort of, of organisms are, are existing? Yeah, uh, well, um, I can tell you that uh, in 2002 was one of the most exciting parts of my career uh -huh. where we got some, uh, some funding and uh, there was new technology to take remotely operated vehicles way into the deep and we did the first biological expedition to the Davidson Seamount. So imagine that um, you're, uh, you have a remotely operated vehicle, it's like a robot about the size of a car that's attached to a cable that goes up to a ship and you have a big control mm -hmm. room. And um, we're in the deep waters, right? It's completely black, it's almost freezing, and we come up to the seamount, and in our light we see these huge corals coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we see these, these pink, large corals, bigger than me, you know? Mm -hmm. And then uh, large yellow sponges, and then you see these, uh, these fluttering things called these crinoids, and it's like, what, what is this in the deep, you know? And you're the first eyes to be able to see that. And so you think corals, right, aren't they found in warm, you know, shallow waters around Florida? But we have these beautiful deep sea uh, corals here, uh, large sponges, strange looking fish, you yes. know, like, like you see in some of the cartoons with, a, uh, you know, a lure coming out of their head, yes. you know, uh, mm -hmm. walking on their, their fins. Uh, there's a one strange fish. It's, it's so strange that only Dr. Seuss could imagine it. He, <laughs> he wrote this book, One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue mm -hmm. Fish. Um, there's actually a, a, a deep sea toad that it's called. And when it's young, it starts off blue. Mm -hmm. And as it matures, it turns red. Wow. So we do have blue fish that turn into red fish. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the other day, uh, there's actually an exploration going on right now at Davidson Seamount uh, mm -hmm. with this group called um, the Nautilus that somebody who works for me as a chief scientist on there right now. Mm -hmm. They came across, it's never been seen before, thousands upon thousands of octopus, deep sea octopus that were living along this crack and they are all uh, hovering over their nest of eggs and there's some w shimmering water coming out of that crack that's probably slightly warmer and they might be using that to help incubate their eggs wow. in the deep. Uh, so Do we have pictures? <laughs> you know what, I got a few frame grabs off of my, uh, off my computer yesterday, but uh, we'll mm. have some nice uh, video footage oh, later on. Andrew, yeah. that is so exciting. That's yeah, like, right. uh, has that ever been seen before? No. No, and this is new stuff Why? that's being seen every day. I think um, since uh, in the last 10 years, from Davidson Seamount alone, we've discovered and named over 20 new species. Um, and, uh, and there are many more to come. Uh, the problem is it, it takes a while to describe these species. Sure. There, there aren't that many taxonomic experts as there used to be. Okay. Uh, so um, if you're interested in exploration, uh, the deep sea is the place to go. And, and some of the, uh, when you go to the website, Monterey Bay, all one word, dot N O A A dot G O V, when people go to that website, uh, are they going to be able to see anything, or is there a website they might want to be able to go to to see the Simon, um, uh, or to, to see uh, live um, shots for, of the deep? Yeah, um, there aren't live shots of the deep uh, mm -hmm. available on the internet um, anywhere right now. Okay. When the Ocean Exploration Trust uh, that we partner with mm -hmm. uh, is out at sea, they will show live, you can look at nautiluslive.com oh, to okay. see what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, if people do want to come to the, uh, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary website and they look under research, it'll take them to our Sanctuary Integrated Monitoring Program and there we have, I think, over 4,000 images yes. uh, of the sanctuary, and people can download them for free. We've now seen these images in textbooks around the world. Uh, people are using them because we have uh, great imagery from working with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Right. We have our own divers out there that are taking pictures. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot available for folks to look at. A lot of input, and that is referred to as Simon. 
Yes, the, Simon. Uh, San Sanctuary Integrated Monitoring System, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Simon. And and is that is C uh, Cal State University Monterey Bay also uh, working? Have have some input with Simon? Are they doing any sort of monitoring along the the shore? Or right. So so seafloor? right right nearby. Right. We do have one of our great partners, uh, California State University Monterey Bay, and they do have um, some of their monitoring programs uploaded. On our um, Simon website, you okay. can see you know what they're finding. Mm -hmm. um, one of the interesting projects with Cal State Monterey Bay right now is they got funding from the state of California to develop an archive of all the deep sea footage mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's been taken up and down the state. I mean, as expensive okay. as it is to get out to sea, yes. some of these ships are thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars a day. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of footage taken. Um, a lot of times a disk is just given to a scientist and, and see you later. Um, we're much more organized uh, in Central California mm -hmm. uh, about tracking our videotapes, mm -hmm. um, but Cal State Monterey Bay is going to be doing that um, for the whole West Coast when wow. the Ocean Protection Council is paying for video to be collected. It should be stored there. Okay. So that's a resource that is just getting started, Good. and we're going to have students analyzing data and looking for questions for a long time to come on that one. Well, that's fantastic because they've yeah. got a lot of lot of things to look through. I imagine uh, they, they, do. <laughs> they, they compiled do. a lot, and uh, I, I have uh, had the opportunity to be over at Imbari before the Monterey Bay uh, um, Aquarium Research Institute as a layperson, yeah. and, and going in and seeing some of their equipment and and seeing some of the videos, and that's that's pretty amazing what they do up there. I it's it's getting so advanced that it's almost like science fiction at this point. You know, it, it is amazing. It's like five years ago or ten years ago I was at a conference there and they and they were just saying, what would you need to be able to do a better job of managing the ocean? And I'm like, I just start thinking, you know, science fiction, what would I want? I'd like, if you can collect a, a drop of water to tell me what, what's been there, I'd like to see what the bottom looks like. And now these things are literally happening. Um, mm -hmm. A couple of weeks ago, a crew came back um, uh, from Mbari to study an area that we're collaborating on called the Sur Ridge. Mm -hmm. And they're now mapping with these autonomous underwater vehicles that look like torpedoes. And they can map down to the centimeter scale. So they're coming back with actual um, dot drawings of individual corals. Wow. Um, and um, we are now have uh, um, working with uh, the Hopkins Marine Station, Stanford University mm -hmm. in Mbari. Uh, we are actually now gathering environmental DNA where we can go to an area, collect a water sample, and anything that has swum by in the last few days, they'll leave DNA that comes off of their skin or through their cells kind of like deep sea crime scene investigation. Ooh. You know, you, you sweep up, look for hair fragments, and sure, you can say sure. he was there. We can now uh, say, oh, this whale has swum by, or we now have deep sea corals. You collect the water, filter the water, replicate the DNA, and then compare it to a gen bank. And so it could be that Ooh. in the future, um, you know, we might not have to look everywhere with a remotely operated vehicle that's very expensive. Mm -hmm. You can. You can cover a couple of uh, miles per day as opposed to sending off these autonomous underwater vehicles and have them collect samples and let you know what's around there. Okay, and now the, the, differ the difference between the two types of vehicles that, that you have discussed, one is an ROV, which is a remotely operated vehicle, and the other is an AUV, which is uh, an autonomous underwater. Uh, underwater. <laughs> that vehicle, that's right. <laughs> and really the, the difference is, is one mm -hmm. of them is attached to a cable. Sure. And you're, you're looking at it as it's operating. The other one you send out on a programmed route and off it goes mm -hmm. and um, it's, it's doing its mapping, it's collecting its water and um, sometimes they have them come to the surface and send data through satellites. Other, otherwise, you have to wait till they come back and you just pick them up. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. One of the most, one of the coolest things that they've, I've, I've seen them do with the uh, autonomous underwater vehicles, is they've sent them on underneath some of the uh, ice caps in uh, around the North Pole, and you know this this vehicle could get lost and you'd lose everything. They want the data along the way, so they would release occasional pods that were warm. They'd melt their way up through oh. the, the ice and then start sending signals <laughs> to a satellite. 
So That's it is. Wild. It's um, <laughs> it's better than the science fiction that I read as a kid. Okay, yeah. and and now, Davidson Seamount AUVs. Uh, it, it wasn't there? Were there any AUVs used around Davidson exploring the Macon? The oh, USS right. Macon. Right. So the Macon is a fascinating story. Um, can you imagine an airship, a blimp, sort of with a rigid inside that can carry 100 sailors? Yeah, right. And they had that, um, you know, in the 40s. Uh, I forget it was in the, even in the 50s. Maybe they you know, they would be flying the um, uh, they'd be flying the coastlines. And in addition to doing observation work, they actually had little biplanes inside right. them right. that they would lower down, they'd fly off, and they'd come back. And to get back up into the airship, you know, this thing that's full of, uh, you know, helium gas. It's flammable. That they, um, <laughs> they, um, they drop a trapeze, just mm -hmm. a long bar, and the biplane has a big hook above its top wing, and they have to fly up hook up onto this thing and, and pull them up. Well, unfortunately, during a storm, um, the, uh, the Macon airship uh, sank off of Big Sur. Mm -hmm. And um, everyone survived except somebody who panicked and jumped out on the way down. The first, per the, uh, the person to jump out, right? Yeah, it was the yeah. person to jump out. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but the, the ship went down, and you know, there were rumors about it, and a fisherman brought back some parts. Uh, eventually, um, that one was discovered with actually a uh, there. Uh, some mapping was done, guessing where it would be. But we sent out. It was when we still would use a, a little yellow submarine called the Delta, uh -huh. and that's what found it. And then okay. later on, uh, we went back and uh, did some mapping uh, with uh, the ROV from Imbari. But oh, okay. It's uh, and it's now been you know registered natural uh, uh, history. Um, uh, piece okay. in, in the deep sea, so it's in the National Registry. Yeah, for those of you who aren't interested in biology, there's tremendous um, <laughs> that, uh, sort of historical artifacts in the deep sea as well. And the and nautical it, history portion of this, the, the sanctuaries is just really, really fascinates me. Especially, the, the, I mean, the first sanctuary was was the Monitor, right? The Monitor was one of the first sanctuaries, and that's on the east coast. Right. So. Right. Um, it's, it's uh, the National Marine Sanctuaries Program. It's a national thing. It's right, really interested. Right. We're supposed to understand and protect for future generations, right. but they're very diverse. Here we've got 6,000 square miles of all these habitats, mm -hmm. and then another sanctuary on the East Coast is essentially one sunken Civil War ship. Exactly. So, big yeah, diversity. Yeah. yeah, I don't even think that it's a mile, a square mile. Is it the, the monitor? Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, but. it's a, it's along mm -hmm. this line of that, that scale. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And then Stellwagen Bank, the beautiful uh, coast uh, on the East Coast, but the Olympic Coast, Cordell Bank. Sanctuaries up and down the West Coast. I yes, love that. that's right. We've got <laughs> we've got five of them, all the way from the the Great Northwest down to Channel Islands, and they're all beautiful in their own way. Now, tell us a little bit more about Sir Ridge, then. Okay, well, Sir Ridge is it's an interesting discovery. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we'd been doing research on seamounts and and uh, deep sea corals at Davidson Seamount, um, and then we came across a, a another project um, which links us all to the ocean. Uh, in that there was a, a shipping container, a series of them that were lost in a storm in uh, the Monterey Bay Sanctuary. So many of you, your viewers, and you, you've seen these, these metal containers that are on trains sure. and trucks. 90% of everything we buy and sell, it gets moved in these. And there was a, a, a big ship going from San Francisco down to Long Beach, and in a storm, it, it dropped a, con uh, a series of containers in the sanctuary. Um, and Bari was working down there, and they found it. And um, so the uh, the shipping company gave us some money to study the impacts of oh. it and to do some mitigation work. Okay. Uh, so we were out there on a cruise um, doing some work on the container. And amazingly, this never happens. We were done a day early. Ooh. Right? And so uh, the chief scientist on that cruise, a good collaborator, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Jim Barry, said, you know, Andrew, you've always wanted to go to this place like Sir Ridge. Why don't you just go there and uh, you know take a look at it? We picked a spot, and um, you know we can we can explore it and and see see what it is. He said, "I've got some manuscripts to write. You know, you just take care of the crew." So we we got there. Um, we dropped at the base of Sir Ridge, about four thousand feet deep. 
we expected to see some things at the surface, and as we came up, we saw this precious coral. It's, called, mm. it's literally called a precious coral. It's oh. this pink thing. They make jewelry out of them. And that was at the bottom, and we moved forward, and there was another coral and another coral. And, and Jim, who was sitting at his computer writing, looked up. Mm -hmm. He looked up again, and then mm -hmm. he closed his computer <laughs> for the rest of the day. Because we, we saw, we came across, you know, one oh. of the most spectacular fields of corals, That's bamboo so corals. And, um, and so that became our deep coral uh, study site. Mm -hmm. It's closer than Davidson. It's shallower. Mm -hmm. There are more corals. And we've now set up what we call a coral observatory there, okay. where we can repeatedly return. We go about a couple of times a year, mm -hmm. and we can actually revisit individual corals and study them through time. My goodness. Now, how uh, old are some of those corals, or are you being able to yeah. tell that? Yeah. You know, interestingly, you can learn a lot uh, from a coral by, in some cases, looking at uh, their rings. Mm -hmm. They have rings like redwood trees. Okay. Um, and Or else looking at the chemistry of um, different isotopes of chemicals as they go mm -hmm. outside from the, the center of the coral to the outside. And we've dated some, uh, uh, we've estimated the age of some corals on Sur Ridge to be 2,500 years old. Um, Is that common? No, I've never heard that before. 2,500 five, years Yes. Old. So if you want to feel good about yourself, you know, you said, how old are you in dog years? You, <laughs> yeah. you can say times seven, I want coral, coral years, divide by 30. You know, you, all of a sudden, you know, oh. you're, you're young. Oh. Um, so, um, you know, that, that's very rough. But there, mm -hmm. the, we know that deep sea corals are old. Um, there was one coral called a gold coral found off of Hawaii, and it was actually dated to be 4,000 years old. Um, so imagine, older than our calendar. Yes. Um, and um, so when we impact them, when we remove them through fish trawling or something, we're impacting some things that could take thousands of years to recover. Yes. Um, but we can also learn a lot from them by looking at the chemistry inside these corals, see what the deep sea was like before the Industrial Revolution or after. There's a lot of information stored in these ancient animals. And, and that, that, that's a great point, Andrew, because you were just talking about some DNA experimentation. Yeah. Could that type of experimentation or a variation uh, of it uh, uh, be possible so that you could know uh, what was actually happening 2,500 years ago or what, what the environmental circumstances were? Yeah. You know, there, there is a, uh, a field of science that actually does look at old things and look at the chemistry from the past. You know, for example, um, there was a whale that washed ashore up in Alaska a few uh, years ago, and they found a prehistoric um, harpoon uh, inside uh, the, um, mm -hmm. the some of the flesh. It, mm -hmm. You know, some you know uh, ancient person a couple of hundred years ago was trying to kill it. It didn't work, um, and so you can you can estimate the age of these animals a couple of hundred years, a couple of thousand years, right. and whether it's bird feathers over the last fifty years. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, whales' teeth, deep mm -hmm. sea corals. You can learn from the chemistry uh, what the Earth was like in the past. That's fantastic. Yeah. New discoveries. New discoveries happening all the time right here in the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, your sanctuary. Thank you so much, and we'll be right back. <laughs> 